Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Kent Davis Packard. I'm president and executive director of Women Forward International. I would like to thank our founding donor, the Embassy of the State of Qatar, for their generous support and the invitation to the Doha Forum to speak today about women and ISIS. Launched at the Aspen Institute, Women Forward International creates unique partnerships between universities and influential client organizations that lead to behavioral changes that advance women to advance humanity. Here in our audience today are two of our university partners, Georgetown University, working with two Afghan women's nonprofits on peace building in Afghanistan, along with leaders from the nonprofit organizations, and the National Defense University, highlighting their Women, Peace, and Security Prize, this year focused on the reintegration of women from ISIS. And you will be able to hear Mercedes Fitchett's a presentation on the Viewpoint stage at 4.40 this afternoon. Well, thank you for joining us here in an oasis in this cosmopolitan desert. Indeed, the Doha Forum in its opening of new ways of thinking in a world in which rigid, dry, dogmatic, two-dimensional thought often pervades and where culture is considered unchangeable and those who dare to be barrier breakers and go beyond words into action for real change can be held back temporarily. Here in Doha, we are going to speak out in order to expose the multifaceted program of ISIS and challenge its culture, or rather our culture, because it is ours. ISIS is ours, it comes out of our societies. We must own it, we must take responsibility. And we're going to focus on this rather elusive form of human identification called women. Why would we need to focus, in particular, on women? Well, because doing so allows us to better understand ISIS, which is recruiting women at unprecedented levels. And their over 20,000 children born in the camps are a captive audience. Not doing so puts us at an incredible disadvantage in our efforts to effectively end its power of appeal to humanity. And that is ultimately our goal here. We are solutions oriented. Women are not on the sidelines of ISIS, but are at the very heart of its survival or failure. Today, we are joined by four barrier breakers who are going to break barriers today by bringing us insights into how ISIS wins women and how women win the war against ISIS. Beginning on my far left, we have an individual who has dedicated her life's research to understanding the motivations of those who practice terrorism, professor of communications at Georgia State University, former fellow at the International Center for the Study of Terrorism at Penn State, and specialist in ethnic conflict, rape and war, child soldiers, female terrorists, and terrorist communications, Dr. Mia Bloom. We also have to her right. We are honored to have with us an activist and award-winning author of The Girl Who Escaped ISIS. As one of the more than 6,500 Yazidi survivors of ISIS enslavement and genocide, Mrs. Farida Abbas Khalaf has been essential to a global advocacy campaign to bring ISIS militants to justice, and to bring awareness of the genocide ISIS carried out in Iraq and women's unique ability to challenge ISIS. She is currently launching a new peace campaign to educate young people about radical groups. To her right, we have an individual who has had his life threatened by ISIS for proclaiming unity between Muslims and Christians, Professor Omar Suleiman, also an imam, founder and president of the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research, professor of Islamic studies at Southern Methodist University, resident scholar of the Valley Ranch Islamic Center, and the co-chair emeritus of Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square. And to my left here, a legend in bringing into the field of international relations and diplomacy the vital connection between policymaking and its effects on women and the status of women's effects on the social, economic, and political prosperity of nations. 
the first ever U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues, Executive Director of Georgetown University's Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, and Special Representative on Gender Issues for the OSCE Chairmanship, Ambassador Milan Verveer. Welcome our panelists. Let me turn first to Ambassador Milan Verveer. Um, I'd like to ask my first question, how does ISIS win over women? Well, thank you, uh, Kent, for bringing us all together, and especially to the Doha Forum and to my co-panelists who uh, you will hear from, and, and many have certainly experienced and, and worked on these issues, uh, even more than I, I think. Um, but ISIS is very aggressively uh, involved in this recruitment for, for many reasons that they appreciate uh, enables them to continue uh, the path that they go forward on. I, I wanna say at the outset that we can't look at women as a monolithic force uh, or stereotype them in ways that really aren't fair to the reality. Um, there are many women who indeed, uh, as you heard from Kent, uh, are perpetrating the violence. They are co-actors in that. Uh, there are others who are working mildly to prevent it. There are others who have suffered horribly. Uh, our colleague on the panel from the Yazidis, uh, what they, the women there have endured and continue to endure uh, of unspeakable horror. So it is not, the experiences are not all of the same. Uh, but it is quite interesting that uh, this barbaric force, ISIS, uh, uses some of the most adept, sophisticated social media technologies uh, to really engage uh, in terms of their recruitment. And they prey on women, basically, through this medium uh, understanding that there are push and pull uh, reasons for women being radicalized. Uh, some of those uh, push uh, reasons have to do with um, legitimate feelings in the Muslim community about the attack uh, on Islam broadly, uh, the attack from the West, that, that feeling of a sense of inferiority and, and the fact that we don't count. These are the kinds of things that ISIS will go in through social media and, and continue to enhance and push on themselves. Uh, <clears throat> others, you heard a lot this morning in the plenary session about failed governance, uh, unemployment, um, the kinds of uh, lack of resources, lack of education, frustration, particularly after the uh, Arab Spring um, uh, didn't come out to be a spring as much of a, as, a, as a winter. Uh, and again, moving in on, in especially locally and regionally, on that issue. Um, other women uh, in this situation are have cultural and social challenges in terms of uh, being Muslim and dealing with a society that oftentimes is very hostile uh, to their religious identity. Uh, and the feelings of isolation and marginalization uh, that they have to deal with. Uh, and again, ISIS is there saying, you're right, come with us. Um, and the come with us, the attraction side, the pull side um, is, is varied, uh, but a lot of it has to do with religious duty, uh, the sense that if I migrate from the land of the inf infidels, to this, this place which will be a utopia, the new caliphate, uh, I can be a part of that. I can fulfill my religious duties in ways I could never have dreamed. Um, and that sense of, of uh, real ability to, to move from the sorry situation that many of them feel they're in to the place of possibility. Uh, others, uh, the, the sense that sort of goes with it, although I think too much is pre put in this category of adventure, but, but a, an adventure in some ways of, and also of a partnership with somebody who's deeply committed um, that she can be married to and together 
uh, they can be in this creation of the new, of the new world they both want to see. And, and then empowerment, wanting to be empowered, wanting to have agency more than they have agency today. Again, the sense of possibility, the sense of attraction, the sense of something I can't be a part of but for my ability uh, to, to join these forces uh, who will enable me. Um, and when you're isolated, when you're feeling down, the possibility of community, of, of sisterhood for women, um, that's another element that's underscored. So ISIS is very, very engaged uh, in, in this effort to recruit women um, from all over the world. And, and the women who are recruited are a very diverse group. They're diverse in age, they're diverse in the places they come from. Uh, so we have to understand that this is a heavily nuanced um, uh, situation that we have to fully consider here. Thank you, Malan. Thank you for outlining the complexity of the situation. I'm like now to turn to Dr. Mia Bloom. You've published about the tricks ISIS uses to um, lure women into ISIS. You've also um, talked about what makes them stay in ISIS despite brutal conditions. Can you tell us about some of your insights? So Milan is absolutely correct. Uh, the kinds of women that ISIS recruited varied not just by age and gender and ethnicity. What necessarily attracted women in Tunisia or women in the Gulf was very different than what they would have done to attract women in the West. The major way in which they lured people in was they capitalized on women's inherent goodness, inherent altruism, and they would ask them, do you want to help the children of Syria? And of course the answer was yes. But what they managed to do was convince them that the only way they could help the children of Syria was to come and be a so-called jihadi bride. At some point, they realized that there was a certain value in the women and that the women would be ranked based on skin color, hair color, breast size, whether they were bint or not. And I said that in Arabic on purpose. But in other words, they were ranking the women and that the more blonde, blue-eyed, white-skinned women would go to a commander, and a darker-skinned woman would go to a lower-ranking member. And so, in a way, they managed to instrumentalize and turn women into a commodity. And this was true, that even such that the women who had been lured in started to notice that they themselves were violating Islamic and Quranic law. So, for example, when the husband died as a mujahid or a shaheed, uh, they, were be, they wouldn't be given their three months and ten days of idda. They were not given the period of time that they were allowed to mourn, and they were turned over and remarried. But now, this time, they had been married before, so they were not as pure, and they got a lower-ranked husband, and they would get a lesser house. And so it was really the worst kind of commodities at the same time that the women themselves were involved in human trafficking and that they, the, the women, there is no culture where women are protecting other women in ISIS. There was no sisterhood. These women were complicit in the rapes of Yazidi women, in the human trafficking of Yazidi children. And so we have to understand that the variation definitely exists and one of the major things is we have to ascertain which women were brought against their will, which ones, let's say children, 14, 15 years old, were lured and tricked, and then which ones themselves are radicalized. And so some of these tricks involved, like I said, convincing women that they were doing something good for their people, their community, their religion, whereas some of the other things were exploiting women's weaknesses. So for example, a woman, let's say, is in, a, in an abusive relationship uh, in the UK, perhaps it's been an arranged marriage. There wasn't an option for her to leave her husband if she was being beaten. And it was a very different narrative. She wouldn't leave the husband because he beat her. She would maybe leave the husband and join her brother in ISIS. And it's a very different conversation the parents are having. It was in some ways weirdly more acceptable to leave your husband to join ISIS than to leave your husband because he was a bad husband. So we have a number of cases in the UK and in France where women didn't just leave, they left and they took the kids. So this is where we have to be aware as we are facing the issue of repatriating the women, 
that they are not a, they are not a monolith at all, like Ambassador Verveer said. And we have to make these distinctions. The biggest problem, of course, is we, we don't have good evidence about what they did. Um, we have some materials, but ISIS was very negligent in the amount that they talked about women on their encrypted platforms. They didn't brag about the women in, in Dabik or in Amak. They didn't talk about the uh, operations. And for the most part, women were not on the front lines as uh, fighters or bombers. They were behind the scenes. And so these might appear as lesser crimes when in fact they were aiding and abetting the worst forms of crimes. So I want to make sure that I give time for everyone else, but uh, we can come back mm -hmm. if there's any questions. Hopefully we'll have time. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Next I'd like to turn to Professor and Imam Omar Suleiman. Um, I'd also like to make sure the audience has headsets ready for the fourth speaker. So if you don't have headsets, the fourth speaker will be speaking in Arabic, and I assure you, you will want to hear her story. So, Professor Suleiman, you are based in Texas. What have you learned from the local community about ISIS's appeal, especially to women? What tools does ISIS use to contact new adherents? How much of it is religious exhortation? Uh, very little of it is religious exhortation. What shapes the path to radicalization is political frustration and the social alienation that um, the ambassador was speaking about. And that's not to say that there isn't any value in refuting ISIS's arguments, their religious arguments. Um, but what makes them so unique in that sense, and you know, there's one myth, uh, a global myth, that they're born out of religious deviation, which is a myth. The second thing is that they have some sort of interpretive framework. Typically, if you study a group like Al-Qaeda or you study some of the other groups, they have some sort of usul, some sort of interpretive framework. ISIS has none. They literally take every verse about disbelievers in the Quran or any tradition, secondary material they can find. Um, then they turn everyone that doesn't follow them into a disbeliever and then take all of those interpretations to unfounded, baseless, uh, violent ends. So, you know, I... I uh, signed the letter to Baghdadi, and a lot of uh, Islamic scholars have refuted their arguments, but we really have to address the root causes. And the root cause is not religious ideology. Now, when you talk about social alienation, you cannot separate Islamophobia, the discussion on Islamophobia, from the discussion uh, of radicalization. And women are disproportionately affected by Islamophobia. In the United States, um, there are upwards of 70% of the victims of Islamophobic hate crimes in France, upwards of 80% of Islamophobic hate crimes. Now, the problem becomes when the counter-radicalization industry seems to have embedded in it the same bigotry that perpetuates that Islamophobia network, then it continues to uh, render people in adverse circumstances where that you do not belong is made attractive. And ISIS's initial call was come to the land of Hijrah when they had territory, obviously, come to the land of migration. It's a society that you can belong to. If you look at Hud al-Muthanna from Alabama, you know, you mentioned many different cases. Hud al-Muthanna spoke about how she hated her parents. She wasn't on speaking terms with her mother for almost an entire year. She had no friends, and she found these, this family on Twitter, right? Now, that's lost on the American public. So when the counter-radicalization industry perpetuates the racism or the bigotry that uh, continues to put people in these circumstances of being stigmatized and being alienated, then they actually serve ISIS's purpose. The second thing in terms of political um, frustration, legitimate political frustration at times, one of the problems is that some of those that launch the efforts or that maintain the efforts of counter-radicalization counter are the state actors that might be responsible for creating the political violence that created ISIS in the first place. And so instead of having honest conversations about the political causes of groups like ISIS, instead, you know, those efforts often go to targeting political opponents. They often target the very institutions that preach mainstream Islam, the mosques where there is a connection between those who go to the mosque and the uh, likelihood of not joining an extremist group or being attracted to it. So they often target political opponents, target mainstream Muslim leaders and institutions, and try to regulate social behaviors. And we have to find a way to actually have honest conversations about those root causes and then fight those root causes and not you know, turn this into the equivalent of the war on drugs in the United States, which turned into a war on African-American youth. You can't target the very community 
that you're trying to help, and oftentimes that's how the Muslim community is perceiving a very real perception or experiencing, I should say, uh, counter-radicalization efforts as they exist in Western nations. Thank you very much. Um, it's really important for us to highlight how we are undermining ourselves and our efforts to counter violent extremism. We're going to talk about solutions to that. I'm going to combine my second and third questions just for the sake of the panelists to let them know. Um, the second question is, given these stories, um, what would compel a woman of ISIS to change her mind? Can she rejoin her society? And in what ways are women uniquely positioned to win this so-called war against ISIS? And how can we help speed that process along? I'm going to ask that to all the panelists after I turn now to Mrs. Farida Khalif. Um, we're going to hear from Mrs. Farida Khalif, someone who has experienced life within the ISIS community firsthand. I'm gonna ask her, how does ISIS win over women? But for the benefit of our audience, I'd like to read a passage in English from Farida's book. And afterwards, she's gonna comment on this passage for us in Arabic and tell us a bit of her story about her captivity in ISIS. Please do put on your headsets for the translation service. As I mentioned, you will want to hear her story. Here is from her book, a very short excerpt. He rolled out his mat and got ready to kneel down and pray I had heard from my friends that the particularly religious ones commonly did this before taking a woman, thereby celebrating their rape as a form of worship. Each time he would carry out his religious ritual beforehand, this I found especially repellent. How could these oh-so-pious people pass the responsibility for their sordid acts onto their God? These people believed hell existed. So did they harbor no concerns about being dragged down there and called to account? I couldn't understand how they could view what they did as their religious right. Couldn't they see that by making such claims they were lying to themselves first and foremost? Their behavior was not in the least God-fearing. It was inhumane and a disgrace to their religion. Mrs. Khalif. Ashab al-Sa'ada, al-Sayyidat wa al-Sa'adat al-Musharikin, a'da' muntada al-Doha, tahiyya tayyiba lakum. Niyabatan an nafsi wa an al-Mujtama' al-Ezidi, al-Ladi ya'ish fi ibadah jama'iyya mustamara. Ashkurikum ala tandim hada al-Hadat al-Muhum, wa atatalla' ila an tatakatif jami'a al-Juhud, من أجل الارتقاء بواقع مجتمعنا وبلداننا على أساس إنسانية بعيدة عن التطرف وخطاب الكراهية والعنف والصراعات الدائرة في مناطقنا سوف أبدأ بالتعليق على مقطع الذي قرأت الدكتورة كينت من كتابي هذا المقطع المروع يصف كل شيء كل ما حدث لي والآلاف النساء والفتيات الصغيرات ولماذا هذا سؤال المحزن والمرعب وخاصة عندما يدعون أن هذا التعليق هذا التعليمات يأتي من الله هذا يجعل عقلي يتوقف ويتركني عاجزا عن الكلام لأن كل تلك الجرائم الفديعة بالنسبة لهم مجازة ومقبولة تماما كما يعتقدون بفعلتهم يرضون الله وتذهب إلى حسناتهم إذا كانت تلك الأشياء الفديعة تأتي من الله فعند إذ لدي أسئلة كثيرة حول هذا الله طالما أن الموضوع الذي سوف نناقشه متعلق بالحياة في دل داعش والسعي إلى الاستمرارية في الحياة سوف أحدثكم عن الجرائم التي ارتكبها تنديم الداعش بحقي وبحق مجتمعي عندما كنت مختطفة ورهينة لديهم على أمل أن تتركوا حجم وخطورة هذا التنديم والفكر الإرهابي على العالم أجمع أنا واحدة من أكثر من ستة آلاف خمسمية امرأة وفتاة إيزيدية تم خطفهم من قبل تنديم داعش 
في 3 أغسطس عام 2014 تعرضنا إلى شدة أنواع التعذيب والإهانات تحت حكمهم لقد مارسوا التعذيب الجسدي والعنف الجنسي بحقنا وتم استخدامنا كسبايا وجواري وكسلع رخيصة للبيع والشراء في أسواق النخاسة قصتي طويلة جدا مع المعاناة في دل داعش لكن سوف أختصرها لكم وللتفاصيل أكثر يمكنكم أن تقرأ كتابي عن حياتي في دل داعش وهي مترجمة إلى أكثر من 14 لغات عالمية فيما يكفي من التفاصيل كنت أعيش مع أسرتي في قرية صغيرة اسمها كوجو جنوب بلدة سنجار بمحافظة نينوى في العراق كنت طالبة في المرحلة الإعدادية في الثالث من أب عام 2014 هاجم داعش على المناطق الإزيدية في سنجار وكانت قريتي من ضمن مخططاتهم للاستيلاء عليها لقد نجح داعش في الاستيلاء على المناطق الإزيدية والمناطق الأقليات الأخرى بعد انسحاب القوات الأمنية دون مقاتلاتهم حيث أنهم فردوا حسار علينا في القرية لمدة 13 يوم كمهلة في الدخول إلى الإسلام وتغير ديانتنا بعد ذلك قاموا بجمع أهل القرية في مدرسة القرية وكانت عائلتي من ضمنهم وطلبوا من أهل القرية أن يتركوا دينهم واعتنقوا الإسلام وهذا الأمر إثارا حفيدا أهل القرية ورفضوا رفضا قاطعا بعد ذلك قام داعش بفصل الرجال عن النساء فأخذوا جميع الرجال بالسيارات إلى أطراف القرية وقتلوهم جميعا بطرق وحشية وكان من ضمنهم والدي وأحد أشقائي خلال فترة احتجازي تم النقل إلى مكان عديدة في سوريا وعراق وكل يوم كنت أتعرض للدرب والعنف في قرية شحيطات بسوريا كنت في منزل يعيش فيه نحو 30 مسلح من الداعش هناك منحوني كهدية للأمير فرفضت ذلك ورفضت أن أكون مع أميرهم فقاموا بدربي وإهانتي وربطوا يداي بالسلاسل الحديدية حيث أن خمسة من المسلحين برفقة الأمير نزلوا علي بالدرب حتى سأل الدم من راسي وعيني ووقعت على الأرض فاقدة الوعي بعد ذلك غادر الأمير وطلب من الجنود إنزال أقصى العقوبات علي لم يكن يمنحوني الطعام فكانوا يعطوني المال حار مرة واحدة في اليوم من هناك تم نقي إلى منطقة ديرازور هناك كان يوجد العديد من الفتيات المختطفات اليزيديات كل مسلح من داعش كان يأتي ويأخذ فتاة في الليل تحت الدرب والتهديد ويعيدها في النهار في الأخير حديت بفرصة للنجاة والهروب منهم لكن الآلاف من الإيزيديات لم يأتيهم هذه الفرصة ولا زالوا يعانون من ظلمهم وشرهم عندما كنت أسيرة في أحد المرات حاولت الانتحار لكي أخلص نفسي من هذه المأساة فقمت بقطع شرائين يدي فوقعت على الأرض مغمية علي فنقلوني إلى دكتورة تابعة لهم لكي تقوم بمعالجتي تمهيدا لبيع مرة أخرى وليس لإنقاذ نفسي داعش لم تقتل الإيزيدية فقط بل قتلوا المسلمين والمسيحيين وكثير من الأبرياء من الأديان المختلفة أعطوا المسيحيين خيارين دفع الجزية أو اعتناق الإسلام لكن نحن الإيزيديين كانوا أمامنا خيارين الدخول إلى الإسلام وتغيير ديانتنا أو الموت 
هذه المقتدفات من قصتي لعلكم تدركون خطورة هذا التنديم الإرهابي على الإنسانية كلها كنت أتأمل أن تكون زوجات وأمهات أعداء داعش أكثر رحمة اتجاه نساء الإزيديات لكن فجئت كثيرا بمعاملتهم معنا نساء داعش كانوا قاسيات وبدون رحمة وتعاملوا معنا بوحشية وقسوة لهذا السبب أطلب من المجتمع الدولي ليس فقط معاقبة رجال داعش بل محاسبة نساء داعش أيضا اليوم أنا سعيدة بأن أكون متواجدة هنا في دوحة وحزينة في نفس الوقت لأن مع الأسف بعد خمس سنوات ولا دولة واحدة من الدول العربية اعترفوا بالإبادة الجماعية ضد الإزيديين ولم نرى خطوات جدية من أي دولة عربية لمساعدة الناجئات والناجئين من داعش أمامنا مهمة صعبة وينبغي أن نتكاتف جميعا من أجل مناهدة العنف المرتكب باسم الدين ومناهدة خطاب الكراهية وتشجيع مبادرات ثقافة السلام وقبول الآخر المختلف عنا من منطلق الدين الله والوطن للجميع الإيزيديون في العراق تعرضوا إلى العديد من الحملات الإبادة الجماعية ولا زالت مستمرة لأن إلى يومنا هذا حوالي 300 ألف إنسان يزيدي لا زال مشردا خارج دياره أكثر من 60 مقبرة جماعية تم اكتشافها للضحايا الإيزيديين الذين قتلوهم داعش في بلدة سنجار حوالي ألفين مختطف ومختطفة إيزيدية لا زال مسيرهم مجهولا على هذا الأساس الأمم المتحدة والعديد من الدول الأخرى كأمريكا وكندا وفرنسا وبريطانيا وأرمينيا وبرتغال ودول أخرى اعترفوا في برلماناتهم بأن تنديم داعش ارتكبوا إبادة جماعية بحق اليزيديين هنا أطالب من البرلمان وحكومة قطر إعداد مشروع الاعتراف بالإبادة اليزيدية كأول دولة عربية كما أطالب من الحكومة قطر تقديم المساعدة للشعب اليزيدي والأقليات الأخرى من خلال المساهمة في إعادة أعمار مناطقنا ومشاريع خيرية وشكرا Thank you, Mrs. Khalif, for having the strength to tell your story, bring it forward, and expose what ISIS did to women. Um, I'm going to combine the last two questions for all of our panelists. I'm going to turn to Ambassador Verveer. We're going to talk about solutions now. So what would compel a woman of ISIS to change her mind, and in what ways are women uniquely positioned to win this so-called war against ISIS? How can we give them the tools and the resources to speed that process along? Ambassador. Well, I think listening to Farida um, and that powerful <clears throat> experience that she uh, gave all of us uh, and then the thought that so many of these women, despite the suffering that they've already endured, are intense with children, without psychosocial support, without other kinds of support. Um, it is no way to win people over who have been tremendously uh, violated as a result of, of ISIS attacks. And then I think about um, the women in the camps in, in Syria and Iraq. Um, and yes, they're, they're not all the same. There are women who are absolute loyal warriors for ISIS still, even in the camps, uh, and especially in the camps. And we read about uh, the kinds of behavior they're uh, organizing in terms of punishments they're meeting out. But there's so many other women in the camps who came and were radicalized and their visions of a utopia turned into a hellish nightmare. They want to go home. Uh, they want to go home with their children, the children Mia talked about. Um, they know they should face uh, 
some sort of punishment for what they've done, and they're prepared to face it. Uh, so I think we have to act, and yet I feel my own view is that we're grossly miscalculating, not addressing these issues. Um, it is complicated in terms of the countries of origin, in terms of uh, what they've gone through, in terms of the ability to figure out exactly what they did uh, so that the punishment can be appropriate. Um, but to leave it where it is uh, is something that is not going to win them over. In fact, could create even worse recidivism uh, and um, re-radicalization in ways that today many of them uh, just want to see their lives mended again. Uh, so I think we, we have to together um, in, in the communities of interest uh, figure out how to address this. Uh, you know, as I said at the outset, women are perpetrating violence, but they're also preventing violence. And I think that too often when we talk about preventing and countering violent extremism, like the kind of extremism that ISIS represents, we are not factoring in women. We are not factoring in them as part of the solution. Uh, in fact, they should be engaged at the outset in the development of strategies that make sense, uh, in the design of those strategies, in the implementation of them. Um, the, the, laws frameworks that the Security Council of the United Nations laid down linking women's agency to peace and security and subsequently adding to it their role in countering extremism, the kind that we're talking about today, is fairly neglected. Um, under, under all of the, the evidence-based case that has been put together, uh, it is documented that women have a critical role to play. First of all, as you've been hearing, uh, they are the victims of a lot of the extremist um, violence that's perpetrated against them. But they are also a big part of the solution uh, in terms of engaging them. Uh, they are the earliest warning systems. Uh, they you know, as one security expert said, before governments and military know what going on is, goes, is going on, women at the local levels more often than not know. That early war warning system is an important part of um, what needs to be done uh, in terms of the solution. They're coming together uh, locally in communities with women's organizations, with religious organizations. Um, you see spiritual guardians, women who are being educated on the Quran in Morocco, for example, and working with young people so they're not buying in ultimately to this very uh, extreme interpretation uh, of Islam. There's much that needs to be done to factor in women as critical players in, in preventing and countering violent extremism. And I think it's time we move the solutions from always the military solutions to the, the solutions that women themselves can bring to the table, but not securitize them, not, not consider human rights, uh, respect who they are, but give them the kind of support they need to make the kind of difference uh, that these communities that are so severely affected um, can, can use and they can bring about that kind of outcome. Thank you, Ambassador Rivera, and that is so important in the way international relations is taught are leading schools for international affairs, including Georgetown University and their program on women, peace, and security. I'm going to turn to Dr. Bloom now. Um, can you tell us more about how women uniquely counter violent extremism? Well, let me just revisit one thing. I think it's important that as we understand women are not a monolith, um, the reintegration of women has had varied success depending on where the women are and where they're from. So for example, a colleague of mine, Dr. Fatima Akilu, uh, runs several centers to help uh, reintegrate women who have been in Boko Haram. And one of the things that she noticed is that there's significant differences between whether it's rural or urban, whether the husbands will take back the wives who were kidnapped, whether they had children with their kidnappers, with Boko Haram, and also how these children are going to be affected by having Boko parents. When you look at that and then you contrast it 
as the imam said to someone like Hora Muthana, whose citizenship, well, she burned her passport when she got to ISIS, but her citizenship has been revoked, and many of these women now are stateless, which actually, technically, whether it's a, a Javid in the UK or Pompeo in the US, it is a violation of the United Nations rules to make a woman stateless. So we have to be very careful as we approach the issue of women, but also we do understand women can play a positive role. Here's where it gets interesting. In the research that I've done, so I wrote a book in 2011 called Bombshell about women and terrorism. And in 2011, when it came out, we didn't have ISIS yet, and women had not yet been part of Boko Haram. But one of the things I talked about is, how did Boko Haram win women over? What they did was they forced people to observe Islamic law about women's inheritance. Up until then, if a, if a woman's father died, the family took all the land. Even though in the Quran it says that she was due 50% of what the men were due. So I think we have a lot of misconceptions about the ways in which the groups ingratiate themselves. And we need to understand why they were popular or how they were ingratiated if we're going to have women play a role in countering the message. So we need a better understanding of what these messages are. The second thing that we noticed is that there were differences in terms of women's ability to engage in countering violent extremism or preventing violent extremism, depending on the age. So those of you may or may not know, but when there is a suicide bomber, the first thing they do is they separate them from the family and they don't let them talk to their mother. And the reason they do that is they're afraid that if they talk to their mother, they may change their mind and not carry out the operation. The mother has a huge impact on whether or not that operation uh, ends up happening or not. But now contrast that, we know in the UK and in France, many of the women were the ones egging the husband on. And so we can't again assume, in as much as we've talked about women not being an, a monolith, we also have to make these nuanced difference about women's role in countering violent extremism. Now there are a number, there's a, over 50 different groups around the world coordinated through a, an NGO called ICANN, which is a women's network that allows these groups to learn their best practices and to see what works, and also understanding that what works in Nigeria may not work in Syria, or what works in Syria may not even work in Lebanon. But knowing what works and sort of tried and true programs. Now the women have to be empowered, not just to fight radicalization, but they also just have to be empowered. One of the best ways to do that, education, employment, and giving women a decision, a seat at the table. And so as we're talking about countering violent extremism, and we're talking about what happens after the end of ISIS, we need to make sure that the women get to speak up. In Afghanistan, when the United States announced it was originally pulling out, um, a group of Afghan women came to the United States, to Washington, D.C., to talk to the congressmen, to talk about how American soldiers pulling out would affect them. This was a very important message. The problem we had was only Democrats attended. Not one Republican showed up. So I think that we also have to understand that at least in the United States, some of these conversations, which should not be based on partisan political affiliation, have been. So as we move forward, we want women to overcome and bridge the gap between left and right, whether it's here, in Europe, in the United States and Canada, but also we want to make sure that they have a voice. And I'm so glad that Ms. Farida was here to give the voice yes. to women. Thank you, Professor Bloom. I'd like to turn now to Professor and Imam Omar Suleiman, and then also have a few minutes for questions from the audience. So please go ahead. We have so, five minutes left of our panel, so just okay. to... <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize that the question about women and solidarity with women often pertains to a very particular narrative. And so in many ways, for example, we talk about the rehabilitation question you know, why is it that we can have rehabilitation of child soldiers in Congo and serial rapists in uh, Serbia and all of these other forms, white nationalist extremism in the United States, but not have rehabilitation for certain groups of women and particularly integration for children, the children that are left behind? And can we properly integrate these children back into society without finding a way to rehabilitate their mothers? With that being said, when it comes to selective solidarity, Wars are often waged in the name of the liberation of women. 
and then women and children are disproportionately impacted by those very same wars and then left to fend for themselves. I would encourage everyone to uh, watch a, a documentary by an Italian journalist, uh, Frances Francesca Minocci, and I know I butchered her name, uh, Minocchi. Thank you so much. And you said it just right. And she was here. Okay, great. So you can let her know that I shouted her out. All right. So uh, the documentary is ISIS Tomorrow, and she talks about the prolonging of these conditions and the prolonging of ISIS. The question to everyone is that, you know, can we really keep on remedying this with more wars that continue to leave women and children to fend for themselves? When these illegal invasions are waged and every Tomahawk missile is $1.6 million, how much of that money could have been used to invest in a child psychologist, into education, into programs to actually rehabilitate these women and children that have been left to fend for themselves? So I think that it's important to have a holistic perspective on this entire thing and to apply consistent standards, whether we're talking about uh, different sets of women in this situation uh, that are obviously always the most adversely impacted and bringing them obviously to the table for solutions, or whether we are talking about uh, rehabilitation of women that have been, uh, you know, sucked into this compared to other conflicts and other uh, issues where UNICEF and other agencies have led the way and paved the way for rehabilitation programs. Thank Can you. I just say one yes. thing very quickly, and that's about stigmatization. Uh, so many of these women are stigmatized because of what happened to them and their experience. The Yazidi women, for example, who have come back home, uh, few, not as many as, as are still languishing. But I think it is credit to your people that the, that the religious community accepted them. They weren't stigmatized. But their children, for example, under Iraqi law, are viewed as Muslims. So you've got a problem in terms of the children uh, that result from, from the, the, the impregnation that happened with the ISIS. So again, it's complicated, but the stigma, is, stigma issue is a very big issue as well. Okay, and I know that, um, thank you, Ambassador, and M Mrs. Khalaf would like to cede her time to someone from the audience. I'm gonna to turn to him first. Um, we have, um, please go ahead, Said. Uh, you, we were gonna have her answer, but her time is now taken. Thank you. So I'm just trying to answer the question on behalf of Ms. Kellef of a winning over ISIS ideology, which is I'm shocked. I'm going to use a not formal language now. I'm shocked that Doha Forum, such an important forum, have rehabilitation of tourism in their agenda. What I mean by tourism or tourists are the women ISIS, ISIS women who joined ISIS, who committed crimes in a time that women and girls like Farida, thousands of them living in tents without psychosocial support, forgetting, and their rehabilitation, it's not on their agenda in many other countries. This panel and other international forums should be about rehabilitation of Christians, Muslims who are thousands, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims suffering in IDP camps. Those women who've been, um, in, in, uh, who, who committed uh, uh, crimes, just like Farida said, should be an agenda of Doha form and other forms, how we bring them to justice, like Germany is doing now, a couple of women who return back. Now, one of, a couple of them are facing a trial in Germany. This should be about how Doha form and many other forms gonna come up with establishing process with how we have um, a peace process that Yazidis, Christians, and other minorities are not devil worshippers. They are human beings. We should live with them as brothers and sisters, separate humanity, peace, instead of rehabilitation of somebody who committed crimes. Thank you for Thank you. the very important point. Yes, from the audience. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm Zohar Atis. I'm an English teacher in the University of Carthage from Tunisia. Uh, I would say I have a comment on, the, uh, on this uh, on the extremism or this, or this phenomenon of extremism. I think that it is a, a Molotov cocktail of anger, ignorance, and poverty. These are the three tenets that uh, uh, can create, or the three substances that can create this cocktail, or uh, Molotov cocktail that can explode at any time, anywhere in the world. Then ignorance here, it's particularly, it's the, the, the lack of a moderate, and, uh, 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 and um, a clear 
religious culture. Those people who commit crimes and such atrocities against minorities in the name of Islam are totally ignoring this, the, the religion. So anyone who introduces himself or herself as a source of, uh, this, uh, uh, of this religion, then they would just believe and do whatever this person would, uh, would order them to do. The second, uh, uh, it's. Uh, uh, May I ask if you? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for these very important points. Can you uh, can you frame it as a question? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Then here, uh, the question is, I think, in uh, or uh, just <laughs> sorry, my 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 way of thinking is that when we know the real reasons that push any human being on this globe to commit an atrocity against another human being, whenever we detect the reasons, then we can go forward to the solutions. Then, uh, in order to, to, uh, to uh, um, I mean, to put an end to the extremist, uh, um, the extremist interpretations, then we have to uh, uh, fund moderate interpretations of religion. In order to, uh, 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 I mean, to put an end to uh, uh, these people or to, uh, to recruiting very marginalized people into this regime, then we have to have a more just yes. and more equitable economy, world economy, not only uh, uh, in, a, in a certain nation. And uh, uh, I think in order to, uh, and, and the anger also, I think the anger then it's, it's the, um, I mean, it's the, the outcome of many injustices that we see in the world. Then we have Thank to you. think globally in order to, to have a remedy to this cancer. Okay. Thank, you, Thank you so much, much. I'm, I'm sorry for being point, too long. And it affirms some of the Kent, comments I just want to say one thing. Yes. Kent, yes. Just one thing. The issue of poverty is relevant in places like Tunisia, and it's relevant in some parts. But when we look at Saudi Arabia, and we look at the fact that, and again, not to go back to 9-11, I apologize, but 15 of 19 were from Saudi Arabia, that you have within the jihad, people who are family, coming from families of millionaires, it's not just poverty. And it's not just outrage. I too am outraged by what Assad did in Ghauta. But I didn't join ISIS. You can make a choice to channel the outrage into pro-social pro and not into anti-social behavior. So I think that we want to understand that what motivates in Tunisia is different than what motivates in the UK. Thank you. I, I think we might be out of time, but let me just check. Do we have one? We have a little more time. Good. Uh, just a couple more questions from the audience. Yes, um, madam, over there. Thank you. Um, um, my question is uh, for Omar Suleiman. Um, my name is Mariana. I'm part of the Muslim community in Mexico. And my question regarding this is how Muslim communities, for example, in Latin America, that we lack a lot of um, literature in our um, in our own language. Many of the of the Mexicans, for example, that convert to Islam, get information from um, extremist sources. And even if they have a legitimate or authentic um, religious spirit to serve God, um, they get information um, in a very extremist way. Like and they don't have other sources of information to to expand their vision and their religious beliefs? Uh, so the quick answer to that is, for everyone's knowledge, by the way, there's a vibrant Muslim community in, in Mexico. Um, I've seen the community in Tijuana and even in Juarez and different places. It's an incredible Muslim community and there are a lot, it's actually the fastest dem uh, growing demographic of Muslim converts in the United States as well is uh, from Latin Americans. and so. There are efforts that are underway right now to translate a lot of good material, uh, inshallah, into Spanish that uh, I hope will solve that problem. Um, so all I can say is stay tuned and give me six months. Okay. We'll do one last question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, hi, my name is Rawa. I'm from Al Jazeera. And my question is to anyone who would like to answer. Uh, you talked about women who were radicalized. Uh, you talked about women like the Yazidis. But what about those women who were living in Raqqa, for example? They were a normal Syrian woman. They are, no one's fighting for them. They were forcedly, uh, they're forcedly, uh, forced to be married to people f from ISIS. Now they have children. They don't even know who the father is because the name they have is 
Abu Muhammad the Chechenian. So this guy left and they left them with kids and no government is accepting to actually register these kids. So you have these women who practically, th th that's not their, their fan they're not fanatics. And at the same time, you have their children. What are we doing about it? It's a, it's a very good point, and it's one of the things that we have fetishized the Western women who joined ISIS, and we forget that the vast majority of the women who were under ISIS's control were local women. Either they were women that had no choice and no vote when the husband left Saudi Arabia or left Al Algeria or Turkey and said, we're going, or these are women who, for purely existential reasons, we know, again, from the children as well, not everyone who was part of ISIS was necessarily radicalized. Some did so for existential purposes, not to lose their house, not to be arrested, or not to be killed. And we have to understand, so I think on a case-by-case -case basis, governments need to deal with the women in a comprehensive fashion, but with empathy and with understanding. And when we even look at the women in Al-Hol, there's only a small fraction of these women are radicalized, but they are the ones imposing their view on the other women. And I was reading a story this morning that they are arranging that their sons will rape the young daughters of women who are not wearing the hijab anymore. That they got to Al-Hol and they decided that they're gonna wear Western clothes. So we have to be still interested in the extent to which the women are policing other women, and not just the al Khansa brigades, but even within the camps, and give justice for all the women. Amen. Anyone else like to answer that question? Well, I, th yes. I think, I think uh, Dr. Bloom has said it all, and I really thank you for the question. Uh, because Syrian women under these situations absolutely also need to be on the list of people to be considered uh, and, and their plight needs to be addressed. And I would say beyond that, having been in a discussion earlier today on, on Syria and the peace, Syrian women are going to be a part of the solution for Syria as well. So there's both addressing this horrible situation and enabling what Syrian women represent to address a future peace. Uh, so I, I thank you for raising the Syrian women issue. Thank you. Well, here at the Doha Forum, it's a little bit easier to imagine a world where societies are welcoming, where no one is alienated, where love for others wins the day, and the next generation is empowered to boldly and bravely go out and make positive change. That's the work of our organization, Women Forward International. And I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank our audience for the excellent questions. <laughs> <laughs>